Today's guest is Susan Pierce Thompson, PhD. She is an adjunct of Associate Professor of Brain and Cognitive Sciences at the University of Rochester and an expert in the psychology of eating. She is president of the Institute for Sustainable Weight Loss and the founder of the worldwide Bright Line Eating Movement. Her first two books, including Bright Line Eating, The Science of Living Happy, Thin and Free, became New York Times bestsellers and instant Hay House favorites. Her work weaves the neuroscience of food addiction with powerful insights from positive psychology, IFS, and 12-step recovery to outline a roadmap for achieving true integrity and self-authorship around food. She is absolutely incredible. You may have heard her on some podcasts already. She is just an amazing authority on the subject of food addiction. So let's go ahead and get into it. Here is Susan Pierce Thompson. Okay, Susan, whoa, the psychology of eating food addictions, other addictions. I love talking about this. Um, I mentioned a little bit before we started that some of the work that I do is look at some of the genetic predispositions in my clients. And I have found so many people that have genetic predispositions for issues with dopamine and serotonin, or maybe they're predisposed to have gut issues, which could affect their GABA levels and all these neurochemicals. Um, And then I'm also, you know, with mindset coaching, I'm fascinated by what leads people into certain patterns and habits, and they're trying to just feel better. That's how I see addictions is like, I'm just trying to feel better. And this is the only thing that I have found that actually works. And so, yeah, can you share your story on how you came into this line of work? Oh, yeah. I come by it, honestly. (laughs) I should have. You are. Yeah, I earned it. Oh, gosh. Well, um, you know, it started really at the age of 14 when I started using drugs, which, you know, started really innocently with a fabulous mushroom trip. And then, uh, you know, it was like the late 1980s and there was the Nancy Reagan, you know, this is your brain. This is your brain on drugs. You know, and just say no drug campaign. And and with that one mushroom experience, which was so phenomenal, I was like, oh, in my little 14-year-old thinking, wow. right? like, drugs aren't bad. Drugs are good. <laughs> wow. And and also, I lost seven pounds um, on that mushroom trip. And I was, I mean, you know, I was probably just really dehydrated. I was up all night trying right. and then slept for another 24 hours and I hadn't eaten or had anything to try. Totally. Um, but I was already heavy at that point. Um, not super heavy, but you know, I probably, let me think, honestly, I probably weighed 20 pounds more than I weigh now, you know, which I noticed them, those pounds. Um, I'm in my right sized body now. And so those were 20 pounds I didn't need. And I don't carry my weight proportionately. It goes all straight to my middle. And so I felt really self-conscious. And, um, so, by the time I was 16, I'd found crystal meth and that was hardcore. And I did that really intensively to the point of drug induced psychosis. And I dropped out of high school. I had been a straight A student and then I dropped out of high school. Uh, and then can I, I pause. Can I pause right there? Like, thank you for sharing that. First of all, I'm a huge fan of psychedelics and plant medicines, and they've been life changing for me. But you bring, and we've had people talk on the show talking about them, but you bring such an important component to that is like a a kid who is young and isn't being mentored on that how that could open them up to taking that down some interesting routes right because you were like well I'm getting a lot out of this I mean I just got my mind opened and I lost seven pounds so like maybe I could just and you had lumped them with drugs because of the don't I don't consider language right if you just look at the (laughs) word like that it just it encompasses like street drugs if you just lump you know, pot and mushrooms and right. and crack into the same right. the same word. Right. So such an important thing yeah. for sharing that because it's like, oh wow, that education piece like yeah. so needs to be there, especially for the younger generation. Okay, so sorry. Uh, like, well, and I think that's a good reason to use words like plant medicine, right? right? So that right. we're not because no one would call crack cocaine plant medicine. <laughs> <laughs> medicine (laughs) i'm healing i'm healing (laughs) um yeah and so right then after the age of 16 you know i did speed for a couple years pretty hardcore i quit speed but then fell in with cocaine and then free based it and then started smoking crack and um at some point there around the age of 18 i started prostituting and uh started making a lot of money as a call girl and so at the age of um, 20 years old, that's that was my resume, you know, crack addict, prostitute, um, high school dropout. And I had a miracle on August 9th, 1994. I got taken to 
a 12 step meeting for drug and alcohol rehabilitation on a on a first date with this room wow. guy I'd met at a gas station at three in the morning. Wow. He took me to a meeting on my on our first date. And I got a 24-hour coin, and I've been clean and sober ever since. That was 28 years ago. Wow. Oh, thank you, God. Yeah. And um, then I got fat really fast because my drug addiction, right. addiction just jumped right over to food addiction. Right. And, and you have an appetite now because you're not on. Yes, <laughs> and I had an appetite, and I had dopamine receptors that were screaming Totally. Or something, you know, yes. they've been blown out by first right. crystal meth and then crack cocaine. So my wow. dopamine receptors were like, uh, feed me, feed me Seymour. Totally. Um, and so I got fat really fast. I knew I would. I mean, I had quit drugs in sort of cycles two or three times throughout my teenage years. Um, and I had always gained 50 pounds, you know, in the blink of an eye and got and gotten really depressed, really depressed because the the right the uppers were definitely self-medication. And I had definitely a tendency, an underlying tendency toward depression. So um I had a I had another moment of clarity uh within the first few months of being sober where I realized um I'm really using food like I used to use drugs. This isn't yeah. just eating. This is using. Um, you know, I was up late at night binging on all these foods. Right. And, you know, going out to smoke a cigarette, coming back in and eating more. And it it really felt like being in the crack house. Mm. Um, so I started going to 12-step meetings for compulsive overeaters um, and you know, didn't really find the magic there the way I did with the drug and alcohol addiction. And I think, you know, in my third book, Resume, I talk about how food addiction is the hardest. It's it's like a whole chapter, like food is the hardest. And I really believe that. I've been addicted to most of the hard things you can be. That's to. crazy. That's probably so healing for people to hear. <laughs> if they're struggling with food, yeah. Yeah. Well, if they're relapsing with it with it, especially like like they get like they, they get it on track and then they find themselves in the ditch again. And it's just food is the hardest. And I think one of the reasons is it's the only substance you can get addicted to, because food addiction is a substance addiction, um, sugar, flour, processed foods, right? Um, and it's the only one you can't abstain from completely. You can abstain completely from crack cocaine and crystal right. and cigarettes and alcohol. There's no substance you can get addicted to that you can't abstain from completely except sugar. And, right. And right. Well, because the line is so blurry and then it's normal, right? Yeah. It's like yeah. how everyone else here is eating that. And so that's an added layer of like, what am I just some weirdo? Like, how come I can't have some? And yeah. yeah. And now you can't can abstain from sugar entirely. Yeah. And I do. I abstain yeah. from sugar entirely. Um, but the line is a little blurry. Like people are always asking me, what about fruit? And I eat whole real fruit. I don't. But where I draw the line is I don't drink fruit juice. Like, so that's where the line is for right. me. I don't eat honey. I don't eat molasses or maple syrup. And I don't drink right. fruit juice. And I don't eat raisins either. I don't eat dried fruit because it's it's just, I mean, think about dried apricots versus whole fresh real apricots, right? I could, I, I could eat four or five whole real apricots, but right. I want a sixth or a seventh or an eighth <laughs> apricot, right? right? But dried apricots? Oh, totally. baby. I'll, totally. I'll take more than six dried apricots. Totally. So, yeah. Can um, you talk it, about... Can, oh, sorry. I, just can you okay. talk about your journey? Like you're 16, you know, you and then your your education journey. What happened? Because you mentioned you were this straight yeah. A student... And then this happened. And then where did you go from an education standpoint from there? Yeah, great question. So, um, you know, food addiction is more socially acceptable, obviously, but you can also kind of function on it and you can even use it to fuel a lot of success. So still using food, I did well in school after I got clean and sober. Um, so I was 20 years old. I got struck clean and sober. I moved in with my mom and I started community college. So I went to San Jose City College. I'm from San Francisco originally, born and raised. Um, then my mom was living in San Jose. So I, I moved down there and um, went to San Jose City College, did great, transferred to UC Berkeley, did great, got 4.0, wow. spoke at the graduation when I graduated in 1997. Wow. Um, and I majored in cognitive science. I was already getting really interested in how the mind and the brain work. Um, For sure. 
and graduated summa cum laude, got into every graduate school I applied to, wanted to keep studying the brain, oh. brain and cognitive sciences. So I, at that time, um, which was 1997, there were only five programs in the whole world, PhD programs in wow. the brain and cognitive sciences. So I applied to them, got into every one <laughs> and went to one of the top programs in the world, um, the University of Rochester out in Rochester, New York, and got my PhD in brain and cognitive sciences, that master's and PhD that took five years. And then I went to the University of New South Wales in Sydney, Australia, and did a two-year postdoctoral research wow. fellowship in psychology. And then I was a psychology professor for 18 years wow. um, at various colleges and universities around the world. Got tenure, got promotion, the whole nine yards. And so I was just studying the mind and the brain, basically. Um, and it was the the juncture where I lost my excess weight and got into the right-sized body that I'm in today, which is for me, I'm petite. I'm a U.S. size four, um, five foot three, 115 pounds. That's my right size for me. Um, uh, and and I had been obese. I mean, by I was living with obesity in my mid twenties already. Um, and so the juncture where I lost my weight was when I was 28 years old, and it was right at the cusp of finishing my PhD and um, moving to Australia for my uh, postdoctoral program. That's when I lost my excess weight. So I've been in my right-sized body now for 19 years, which is highly unusual uh, in the medical literature for someone living with obesity to then get slender and live slender for practically two decades is, is practically unheard of. Well, this is such an interesting journey. You know, I'm fascinated because you're learning so much about the brain and how all of these chemicals are affecting you. You've been through this thing and you're still holding on to some extra weight. Like, what was that transition? Like, what what clicked? What happened yeah. when you were 28? Yeah, what happened was I found a different 12-step food program and it was people who were much clearer about not eating sugar and not eating flour weighing and measuring the quantities of food, not to eat to like a tiny little amount, but really to eat enough vegetables and to make yeah. sure eating enough of the right foods. Yeah. Um, and not too much of the other foods, right? right. And um, because I was saying how food is a substance that you have to, you have to keep, you know, eating food, but um, it's also a process addiction or a behavioral addiction. Yeah. And so having boundaries around when and how much you eat is really important so that you don't have a brain that hounds you like, can yeah. I eat more? Have I had enough yet? How about now? Can I eat now? Is it right. enough yet? Can I eat now? How about more? Uh, so I love that. Boundaries. I love that because I intermittent fast and I'm like, I'm not crazy about like the intermittent fast. It's mostly I just want to sleep well. And so yeah. I just cut off eating three hours before bed for the sole purpose of, I will wake up feeling so amazing and have so much energy and it's good for my body and repair. But it, it sure makes it easy because when yeah. I start to get hungry, maybe at 730, I'm like, dude, you're going to sleep in like and half an hour for, you know, starting yeah. to bed. Like you're good. And that just having that decision already made is makes things really easy versus like, so well, I guess tonight maybe I'll have, you know, it's it's boundaries. I love that you put that word yeah. out. Structured eating, I think, is really important. Our society has gone really far into the realm of unstructured eating, like yeah, no, no. almost tout it religiously. Like, and and we use the word True. moderation, but what we True. really mean is eat whatever, whenever is yeah. what yeah. moderation means. Whatever, whenever, right? Totally. And that kind of unstructured eating, I am convinced, is not good for us. I'm convinced wow. that structured eating is way healthier. Wow. Um, and I'm That's curious, Tara, what your what your intermittent fast, what your definition of intermittent fasting is and what your uh, feeding and fasting window is. I'm just curious. So I always tell people, I'm like, it's almost like I'm not even really doing it on purpose. I'm not like, oh, it's uh, not 11 o'clock yet. I can't eat. It's not like that. It, for me, it's it starts the night before. And it's for me, it's three hours before bed. I'm, I'm pretty, I've gotten... It sounds really type A and it's not my personality at all. I am very like, fly by the seat of my pants. But I've just learned what this does for my life. If I have a consistent bedtime and wake up time, like it's been life changing. So it's more of a want to. So I know I'm going to sleep at nine. So six, maybe sometimes, you know, life happens. I've got kids like my, my B7. So I'm eating at 630. But most of the time it's I'm done by six. And if I ate a lot at 430 and I'm like super full, it might be 430 one day. But it's just kind of just giving my body a few hours to process food before I go to sleep. 
wake up. You're done eating at six. I'm done eating at six typically. And then I get up and I meditate. I get up at five and I Mm -hmm. meditate, do my little personal development stuff. And then I go to the gym and I might be running around. And I generally, I mean, it it really depends on the day. Someday it might, I would say typically 11 would be like a normal time, maybe nine one day, maybe 10. But it's just like I'm working out. I prefer to work out faster and I kind of have a, I do have a reason for that. I'm I, I won't get into the details, but like I have a calm tea, slow calm tea. I'm prone to adrenaline. It's a massive uh, workout athletic performance booster for me. So I do really well on fasted workouts. So I just prefer it. Um, and then I just wait till I get hungry and I just eat. And then I eat throughout the day. Um, so I, I'd say typically 11 to 6 is pretty typical for me, you know, and I, I it's just focusing on nourishing like I need lots of protein because I have a lot of muscle. I need vegetables because it's good for my gut and my, you know, short chain fatty acids and all of that yeah. stuff. And I'm also not a perfectionist. For me, I'm I'm really fascinated by the sugar addiction. I really want to get into this because I don't feel addicted to sugar. Like I can have a little bit here and there, but I'm also fascinated by that because I also feel like I definitely have an addictive personality and it runs in my family like crazy. And, you know, my gene snips on dopamine are all like questionable. And so I'm fascinated by that. I truly, I'm still kind of observing that in myself because I'm like, I definitely feel like I used to be, I used to be overweight like my whole life, you know, um, was like 40 pounds overweight. And so I felt like that then. Now I don't feel like that, which is interesting. So um, yeah, I'm kind of tangenting, but I would love to talk about like what leads into this from a maybe neurochemical standpoint and a psychological standpoint, the sugar addiction and who, you know, I you hear people say this all the time. I know I'm addi- I'm in the keto world. So, I mean, this sugar addiction is like everywhere. You know, I don't do keto yeah. anymore, but um, it, it's I'm curious what your thoughts are in terms of sugar addiction, why some people feel addicted from both a, you know, chemical and a psychological standpoint. Do you feel like there's both of those at play? Do you feel like it's purely chemical? Like Absolutely. No, I think so. Yeah. So um, and I want to address your curiosity around the genetics as well. And like, could you be susceptible to sugar? Yeah. Just not have developed it yet or whatever. Right. So, right. Um, OK, so let's start with the genetics. Um, this is really interesting. Research shows that not everyone is susceptible to addiction. Um, about a third of people just will never get addicted to anything. And so uh, people don't realize this. I hear people all the time saying everyone's addicted to something. Yeah. And it's just not true. Um, Addiction is a serious thing. Addiction is using when you don't want to be using. Addiction is using to the point of harming yourself. Addiction is using and not being able to stop. Addiction is a serious thing. Right. Um, You know, having a bad habit is not addiction. Right. Um, So... About a third of people aren't susceptible to addiction. And I mean, literally, you could shoot them up with heroin every day and they wouldn't get addicted to it. Wow, really? I mean. Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah. Well, just look at all the people we send home with um, opioid prescriptions after back surgery. Right. And they don't all become pill heads. They right. take those pills every four to six hours as prescribed. And then when when they think their pain might be lessening, they wean off it and they're fine. Okay, question on that note. Do you think it's because they tend to have lower baseline neurotransmitters that that thing is providing them with? Like, you know, from a genetic standpoint, are they predisposed to lower serotonin and that leads to alcohol addiction, predisposed to lower dopamine and that leads to, you know, any upper addiction? I'm curious. The research that is most compelling, I think, suggests that what their brains are, the ones who are, who are, um, well, okay, the brains of people who are not susceptible to addiction yeah. wire to rewards, but not to the cues that predict the rewards. Huh. So, for example, the rats who are not susceptible to addiction, if they do this experiment, um, to to there's goal tracking rats and sign tracking rats, uh, and the goal tracking rats are not addictable. And the sign tracking rats are addictable. So let me describe the experiment. The rat is in a little Skinner box, right? A box that's got a lever that it could press for food and so forth. Okay. Um, This big bar comes slamming down into the middle of the room. And then uh, two seconds later or a second later, a food pellet gets delivered into the little dish. Okay. So the bar is the cue. Right. Reward is the food. 
Okay. Yeah. Uh, the goal is the food, right? So okay. uh, all rats notice the bar, go, huh. And then the food gets delivered and run over and gobble up the food. All rats do that. Right. But give it a thousand trials, right? And the the goal tracking rats will see the bar come down and run right over to the food dish. Right. And just go, oh, good. Food's coming. Right. The sign tracking rats, the bar will come down and they'll go rub on the bar. They'll like love the bar. They're like, trusty the bar. <laughs> And if wow. if you actually uh, make the food pellet come out and then suck back up, they'll sometimes miss the food pellet because they're so into the bar. Wow. So what? Those are the addictable rats. So what people who are addicted are is they're really good at predicting the cues that predict rewards, like being wow. into the cues that predict rewards, being drawn into the cues that predict rewards, wow. which means. Drawn toward the Starbucks sign. It means drawn toward the golden arches. It means really being affected by the time of day that predicts that now the kids are in bed so you can go raid the freezer and get the ice cream totally. and go get the bag totally. of chili. And if you can picture if you are like really affected by the cues that predict rewards in our society, you're sunk when it comes to food. Because think about the sights, the sounds, the times of day, the logos, the places, mm -hmm. the commercials, the et cetera, right? That tell you that a food reward is potentially available, right? It's yeah. like we live in just a one totally. But But if you're sort of pragmatic about it and you're like, oh, a food reward, it's time to eat. You eat the food, but the cues aren't particularly swaying you. Yeah. You're much more immune. Anyway, so that's so genetically speaking, uh, one third are not susceptible to addiction. One third are moderately susceptible. One third are highly susceptible. Got it. OK. And, you know, you can just look in your family tree. Right. Where are the smokers? Where's the drinkers? Where's the drug addicts? Where's the people who are obese? Right. Just look at your look at your family tree. It's absolutely genetic, highly mm -hmm. genetic. It's, it's mm -hmm. as genetic as intelligence or, mm -hmm. you know, extroversion or whatever. It's highly genetic. Um, okay. So now you might have a family with a bunch of addicts in it, right? A bunch of mm -hmm. people who are highly susceptible. So how come you don't have sugar addiction? Well, uh, I'm highly susceptible to addiction and I don't have shopping addiction and I don't have gambling addiction. Yeah. I've had all the others. Right. Um, and so you have to develop and wire up a specific addiction, Wow. With your brain noticing, like having some pain or needing to numb out or whatever, or whatever, for whatever reason, noticing like a Makes hit sense. coming in and going, oh, yeah, baby, that'll do. Like, and that yeah. was good. Right. Yeah. And then doing it again and wiring up to those cues and those rewards. Makes sense. And you got to go kind of far down that track. And and it's a it's an exposure repeat kind of kind of dealio, you know, so you haven't gotten there yet. Now, maybe if you were going through a divorce or a child died or something like that and you started swinging by Starbucks or, you know. Oh, no, I've been. I've lived that. Island. I've lived that life. Oh, it was bad. I mean, I the whole drive around middle of the night, go to the gas station like I've I've been there. I've, I've lived that life before and I know what it likes and it freaking sucks for yeah. me learning breath work, uh, really a lot of self-inquiry process, stuff like that. And we'll get into your process because I know what people are going to want to hear. But I've, I've been able to come out of it. It's been an interesting place. But I love what you're saying about like how I feel. I, I definitely feel like I have a very addictive personality. I know that about myself. Yeah. Right. And and mm -hmm. I'm like, well, if I'm going to be like that, I might as well choose things that build my life instead of destroy them. So am I do I have an addiction to uh, working out every day, meditating every day, crushing my business, spending time with my kids, having a bedtime. Like, like that's how I've, quote unquote, yeah. wired that up. You know what Sound I mean? Like me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm like, I know what those aren't addictions. Those are habits. <laughs> those are healthy habits, right? Yeah. You're not crying, you know, saying, I'm hurting myself. Why can't I stop doing this? Right. Yes. So they're yeah. not addictions. They're I have habits. been there, but I've had to learn to kind of, you know, people will say, you're so disciplined. And I'm like, well, I don't know. Maybe my addictive personality like helps me out in that area. But I'm like, I just know that I have this like not have to. I want to be like this or otherwise life gets real shitty real quick. And I've lived that life and I don't want to live that life anymore. You know, so, OK, 
So somebody's listening to this and they're like, uh, yeah, uh, I'm like binging on crazy stuff all the time or I'm addicted to cigarettes or you know, the alcohol thing. Like I cannot get a grip. W- where do they start? Yeah, they go to brightlineeating.com. Yeah. I, I, so um, maybe we should fast forward in my story and share like how I cre- yeah, oh, yeah, created it. Like, yeah, yeah. Let's, let's keep going. So where do we leave off? So um, I'm a psychology professor um, for 18 years. And I'm teaching a college course on the psychology of eating and body image with a big unit in it on the neuroscience of food addiction. Cool. And it was 19, no, uh, what year was it? It was 2014. It was 2014. And at that point, I'd been in my right size body for like 11 years. And I'd helped probably about a hundred people at that time to lose their excess weight and keep it off. Awesome. And um, I was doing about 30 hours a week of vo- just for fun and for free volunteer work, doing that, helping people that way. Mm-hmm. And um, and I was teaching this college course. So I was really dedicated to helping people get their excess weight off and recover yeah. from food addiction. That's cool. And um, I had a powerful spiritual experience in my morning meditation. So my morning sounds just like your morning. I, I, except I work out before I meditate. But like, basically I get up at five, work out, uh, I meditate, uh, et cetera. Um, So I was in my morning meditation and um, I swear the universe just laid it on my heart. Um, Mm. You need to write a book called Bright Line Eating. Wow. And and the title came and everything. Oh. I think it was the first time those words were ever strung together in that order. Very cool. And it also, that that meditation session came with pulses of feeling people's prayers, people, people wow. crying in the fetal position, crying to God, please wow. help me change my eating. I cannot go on like this wow. anymore, my weight yeah. and my eating. And uh, I got a vision of myself on the Today Show and the book being a New York Times bestseller. And it was like, you've got to write this book. This book is going to help heal the world. It's going to really change the world. It's going to really make a difference. So I started getting up the next morning. Awesome. I set my alarm for, I think it was 4.25 a.m. so that I could be in my chair uh, on my laptop writing a book proposal for half an hour every day from 4.30 to 5 a.m. Yeah, because I had no other spare time. I had three kids yep. at that point. My kids were five, five, and two years old. I had twins. Yes. Oh. There was no other time. Um, yeah, so. that's how I wrote my book too. It was like you don't get to go to the gym until you write. <laughs> <laughs> yep, it was uh, a little reward brain. <laughs> <laughs> oh gosh. So yeah. Um. So then I learned that I had to, I wasn't going to get an agent and a publisher like a proper publisher if I didn't already have some sort of following in advance so I started an email list and I I count the beginning of the bright line eating movement from the first day I sent the first email and the email list spread really fast actually because I was just sharing helpful interesting stuff about the neuroscience of yeah of really effective weight loss. Like how do, how is your brain blocking you from losing weight? Yeah. And how do you actually get that weight off and keep it off? And um, so the the email list started to mushroom and grow. And then people started to write me back and say, well, how do I, you know, how do I travel? How do I feed my kids? How do I eat in restaurants? How do I know if I'm a food addict? Do you have a quiz I could take? And I was like, oh, geez, I got to make a quiz. And, you know, all this stuff started to happen. And so I ended up developing because I was a college professor i ended up developing an online course and putting it up online and launching it a few times a year and um and bright line eating was born and the book did eventually get published like three years later it came out it it hit the new york times bestseller list and i was on the today show everything came true from that vision um and yeah so the book is called bright line eating uh and so yeah bright line eating has now oh my gosh like two yeah, about two, maybe two and a half million people have joined the email list in these eight that years. That is insane. It's oh. insane. From every country on planet Earth. Oh, um, no. It and... just shows you how many people are struggling with this. I just had a call with a client about this, like, an hour before we started. And I was like, girl, like, you're normal. <laughs> like, this is, there. this is, like, what every client yeah. who comes to me like that, like, they're in it yeah, so garden sad. variety. Yeah, garden yeah. variety. And they're like, I hate myself and I spiral. And, and I'm like, 
you and Ed, like everyone else, like literally every client who's ever come to me pretty much, you know? So it's like that number is powerful too, because it just shows what an issue this is. And I find it to be very healing for people to find out that they're normal, that, you know, it's like, or common, at least their yeah. issues are common, you know? Yeah. So, wow. So brightlineeating.com is where people can, do you always have the course available or do they have to join a certain time of year? Yeah. So it's a membership now. So it's okay. available all the time. It's cooling admission. Yes. Okay. Um, as of right now, I mean, I don't know if this podcast episode is going to live long into the future. We might, we consider sometimes um, changing it back to where it's like we just do cohorts going through but um, as of right now, it's rolling admission. And so Brightline Eating is B-R-I-G-H-T-L-I-N-E, right? So common spellings. Yeah. And yeah. I'll link so that all in the, in the book starts. as well. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Can you share with us some nuggets from Brightline Eating? Yeah, totally. So I think the first, I w- you know what I would love to share is we have a research program. We've been studying people who do bright line eating and publishing our findings in peer reviewed scientific journals. So I'm an academician, right? I'm a scientist. So awesome. And I still have an appointment at um, in the Department of Brain and Cognitive Sciences at the University of Rochester, still on the faculty there. And so I want to share what happens because I think people think, because I certainly thought this, that it's it's going to feel really restrictive to not eat sugar and not eat flour and weigh and measure your food. And what our research shows is that within two months, people's peace and serenity with food has skyrocketed. It's gone way, way, way up. It's not I gone bet. down. It's not yeah. gone down. It's gone way up. Yeah. So you think that it's going to feel restrictive, but abs- actually it feels liberating. Yeah. Yeah. Um, totally research also shows that within two months, people's hunger has gone way down. It, it goes down steadily, just about linearly for the first two months. And then it bottoms out at little to no hunger anymore ever, which is amazing. Um, and then people's cravings also go down, 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 bottoming out at little to no cravings anymore ever after about two months. Um, the first week, the cravings don't start going down. It's really in week two that the cravings start going down. And then um, here's a great finding. I love this. People often think, well, I'm past a certain age. I can't really lose weight now, right? I'm 50, I'm 60, I'm 70, right? And we, um, we've had a lot of people go through our program. So we took a cohort of 4,600 people and we looked at their ages and we tracked their weight loss. And the, the weight loss was equivalently fast, Nice. Whether they were in their 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, or 80s. So, nice. like, unbelievable. And and people might think, well, that can't be because we all know that after menopause, it's harder to lose weight. And so that is true. That is true. It's harder to lose weight after menopause. But when you um, look at why, the reason why is because of estrogen. So estrogen tanks after menopause. It, mm-hmm. it goes from being pretty robust to mm-hmm. practically non-existent, right? Mm-hmm. Estrogen goes way down. And estrogen has a facilitating effect on insulin, which is a fat storage and fat release mm-hmm. hormone. And when you're dieting or doing, let's say you're eating one point brownies, right? And you're like, but, but you know, or like those little snack packs of things that are like 100 calories or whatever. And then you're like trying to eat. A, yeah. If you're eating like that, right? You still need your insulin um, to help out because you're eating processed crappy food, you know, sometimes and that's affecting your blood sugar, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but if you eliminate sugar and flour, now, your blood sugar is regulating itself and you don't need estrogen to provide that facilitating effect on insulin and it levels the playing field and it turns your 60-year-old body into the fat burning machine of a 20 or 30-year-old. So that's the difference. So no sugar, no flour has big um, impacts. Now, our program is really um, community oriented and very supportive. We have an incredibly loving, supportive community. And um, because of that, we find amazing effects, not just on yeah. health and weight loss, but also on um, people's psychosocial metrics. So we published a study a couple of years ago. We looked at 
um, what happened to people who started Brightline Eating during COVID. So I mean, like April, May and June of 2020, right? When we were all going out of our minds, like what is going on, right? Yeah. And we looked at that cohort of people compared to people in the nine months prior to that and the nine months after that. And what the data show, we looked at a whole bunch of psychosocial metrics. So we looked at, so first of all, everyone, whether they, no matter when they started Bright Line Eating, everyone had an enormous increase in their energy levels. Everyone had an enormous yeah. increase in their feeling of happiness, like yeah. well overall well-being. Everyone had an enormous increase in their feeling of being loved and supported and connected in the world mm -hmm. because of our amazing community. Totally. Everyone had a huge decrease in their depression, um, depression like re reduced, and days of poor mental health reduced as mm -hmm. well. So depression, anxiety, all sorts of poor mental health, right? Um, so lots of powerful psychometri psychosocial metrics. But what's interesting is every one of those measurements that I just talked about, the improvement for the people who started during COVID, April, May, and June of 2020, the improvement was even more so. We're talking taking already whopping effects and, and boosting them even higher, yeah. showing that joining our community has some sort of like resilience effect, right? Yeah. When they minded it so right, yeah, they needed it. it so much. Yeah, they probably appreciated it so much. Yeah, I, so I love that you made a community with it. I, um, you know, running little online group things and then having my one-on-one -on -one clients. I started to see that I was like, my one-on-one -on -one clients are missing out. Like they need, they need that too. So that's why I put all my one-on-one -on -one clients in a group for that same thing. It's so oh. powerful when you find out. Just hearing somebody say like that they had the same experience as you is. Oh, powerful. It's like, oh, okay. Well, we can do this together. We got this. You know, it's very powerful. So I love that you added that to it. And no doubt when you stop eating stuff that's making your blood sugar go up and down all the time and you're hating yourself because you can't control it. And then you get into a place where you're like not experiencing that anymore. You're going to feel a little bit happier, less depressed. Like, so no doubt that your community is just thriving. And I think it's so awesome. I love hearing stories like this where it's like, Yep, you have to go through the thick of it. You have to go through all the things. And universe, we're going to provide you a way out in all of these awesome tools. And so you can help a lot of people. And I see that so much in your story. And thank you for showing up to the plate. Thanks for being so vulnerable and honest about everything you've been through. Because it just, it helps people see like, okay, if she can come back from that, I can come back from this donut addiction I got or this ice cream addiction I got. Like we we could do this. So and then, man, adding on all the education on top of it. Holy shit, you're all like really good work. <laughs> I was going to I was going to censor myself. but I was like, nah. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. All right. We will we will link up your books. Also, the course brightlineeating.com and the show notes. Um, Any last little wisdom nugget for anybody who's in the thick of it right now with spiraling and food addictions? Yeah, um, I think it's really important to know what kind of brain you've got, because if you've got a brain that's highly susceptible to food addiction in particular, you're going to need um, a high octane solution, right? Especially if you yeah. have weight to lose. Yeah. Um, even if you don't have weight to lose, even if really you're just trying to get peace uh, yeah. and a brain that's not hounding you all the time. Right. And so I suggest you go to foodfreedomquiz.com, foodfreedomquiz.com. And we've got a quiz there. It's scientifically validated and it'll give you a score from one to 10. And that score just tells you how susceptible your brain is to food addiction. And if you score seven, eight, nine, or 10, you're going to need a high octane solution. You're going to need something like bright line eating. If you're trying to take off weight or if you're trying to get peace, you're trying to reduce the chatter in your brain around what you've eaten or not eaten, whether you're on your plan or off your plan, how many miles, how many calories, how many pounds, like that insanity um, can stop. And But you're going to need a structured way of eating. And for you, structure is going to feel like freedom. It's going to feel like freedom. And I want you to know that, that a structured plan isn't Society will tell you it's unrealistic. You can't expect yourself to abstain from sugar completely. Poppycock, I've been doing this for 19 years. You can totally yeah. abstain from sugar completely. Um, and awesome. it'll it'll be liberating. So go to foodfreedomquiz.com and find out what kind of brain you have. Do yourself a favor 
um, because that's what that's the information that will empower you. Once you know that your brain works differently than other people, you know what to say when people say, no, I just eat a little, you know, and it's like, well, I'm not I, you. That, I, I'm not you. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I'm not you. My brain yeah. didn't work the way yours does. I'm, yeah. I'm, a, I'm a nine on the susceptibility scale and you're probably a four, you know, yeah. or a three or a two. So yeah. yeah, I love that. That's very empowering for people. We'll link that up as well. Susan, thank you so much. It's been an yeah. honor. Sarah, it's been great to today. you. Thanks so much. 